Okay, so let's move on to the shoulder. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about technical considerations when doing MR of the shoulder, and then talk about impingement, rotator cuff disease, instability, and, and other things. So the high field, you know, we, we've seen our protocols. I'm not going to go through the details of the protocols here. Uh, we typically now just do T2 and PD fat side imaging in the coronal plane. T2, the tendon, as you know, should be uniformly dark. PD fat set, there can be some inhomogeneity. If it's prominent, we and the uh, margins, both the joint side surface and the uh, brosal side surface are well maintained with normal, uh, we typically call it tendinosis. Uh, and then we typically do a T1 in the axial plane and a PD fat set. A lot of people like to do T2 fat sets, but I'm not a big fan of T2 fat sets. I think the contrast becomes worse. Uh, though you can see surface is better, but the signal to noise drops off in most scanners. Uh, and uh, uh, now we, uh, and, I, and I think if you're really looking for the surface structures, the T2 non fat suppressed image, which we do in the coronal plane, is often best for the surface. Okay. Uh, Taysen, what do you think of this case? All right, 25 year old prior of labral repair. Um, I see a focus of susceptibility artifact at the. Uh, right. And you can see a little bit of density here on the CT scan. Uh, you can see how much MR scan ac accentuates metallic artifact due to the. Uh, and homogeneous magnetic field and, and RF fields induced by the object if it's magnetic or the object if it's metallic. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, protocol is a little different for low fields, and then we add a uh, fat suppressed sequence in the arthrograms, uh, uh, which you've all seen. So, uh, uh, here's a study that was published in Skeletal Radiology in 2016. Uh, for a long time, people would do MR arthrograms of the shoulder to evaluate for rotator cuff. This was a paper that really showed that there was no difference in uh, diagnostic accuracy if you use arthrogram or not arthrogram, which was my experience over many years. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, it's also, we often use it after surgery, uh, but we now know that uh, the postoperative shoulders, after you you do uh, primary repair with the suture rank replacements, are typically not uh, watertight. So getting fluid into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa in an arthrogram after surgery is uh, not an indication that you have a tear. You need to actually look at the tear within the uh, tendon itself. And uh, I don't think arthrography is all that helpful in doing that. In fact, I think it's a much more physiologic study if you don't do arthrography. Where arthrography, I think, can be helpful is in looking at the labrum at times, because uh, often with standard imaging, we don't really get great views of some of the uh, labrum, especially posteriorly, inferiorly, and anteriorly, inferiorly uh, uh, in the shoulder. And I think sometimes contrast can be helpful in that setting. But I, I only recommend that in, in young athletes. I think in middle-aged and older individuals, there's really no role for arthrography myself. And this just shows MR imaging after arthrography. And one of the things that uh, commonly occurs with arthrography, even now, even with a lot of people with a lot of experience, is you inject uh, in... Uh, areas that you're not planning on injecting. As we can see here, this was a supraspinatus injection uh, in this particular patient. And you see injections many places. I, I especially do not recommend arthrography in the setting of recent trauma. And the problem there is sometimes it can be difficult to look for muscle injuries when you have arthrography if you have uh, as often occurs, 
uh, extra articular injections of the contrast. So uh, if there's been acute uh, trauma, uh, I really prefer imaging without arthrography. Uh, see. Okay, so we have an arthrogram injection. I see uh, contrast in the glenohumeral joint running along the uh, bicep tendon. Okay. Um, it's articular here. Yeah, is it? A bit up there. Yeah, so that's extra articular. Uh, maybe is there a tear along the foot plate there? So it makes you think that there might be a tear here. I think this is uh, this is a CT scan, a CT arthrogram. Uh, one thing to remember is you m many people when they, they inject anteriorly, and you often will go right through the anterior portion of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and it's very common to get contrast. Uh, extending uh, back along the course of the injection, and that and then you can often get contrast within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa uh, just because you have extra articular contrast. So be careful of that. Uh, this patient's rotator cuff was perfectly intact, so there was no tear there. So there are a lot of false positives that you have to be careful for. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Earlier on, there was a big discussion about what's the appropriate field of view. And I just want to show here, here's a coronal image. This is on the same scanner, the same individual, uh, within about 10 minutes of each other. This was scanning a 24 field of view, which at one time was uh, common in the early days, not anymore. And that, that patient, same patient was scanned with a 12 centimeter field of view. And you can see much more detail uh, in, in the different structures. Uh, so... Uh, spatial resolution is really important, especially if you're looking for the labrum. And uh, uh, so you, you have to make sure you image. And this can be an image with a high enough resolution to be able to see the structures you want to look at. Uh, the, uh, this is especially true where a lot of people cut corners at low field, where people will scan with high fields of views because there's poor signal to noise. And this, uh, the images look better if you use a larger field of view. But if you can't see the uh, anatomic detail, uh, then uh, it, it can be a real problem. And I'll show further examples where, the, where that can be an issue. Another thing, when you put a contrast in, uh, we again believe here that you have to have at least one image that's a T2 non-fat suppressed. Uh, I like that. Uh, and the sagittal plane so that we can see the high signal within the normal fat within the rotator cuff interval. If you fat suppress it, it's much harder to look for frozen shoulder, uh, which as you guys know is a very common diagnosis that, that we have to make. And I think you really de you know, tie your hands behind your back if you fat suppress the sagittal images. Uh, some of our referring physicians are used to fat suppressed images where they're trained. So occasionally, we, for some people, will do both T2 non-fat suppressed and PD fat suppressed images in the sagittal plane. And here we can see that the contrast that was injected is kind of gray in signal intensity on T2 weighted images because it was a little bit higher concentration than I typically like, like LIKE. Okay. In the axial plane, we can see the anatomy. You can see the anatomy of the, of the inferior labrum here quite nicely. Uh, when you have contrast into the joint space. Uh, typically nowadays, the PD fat sat images are of such good quality that I think uh, we almost always can see the labrum quite nicely without contrast, uh, especially in the young athletes who have uh, otherwise good tissues. And in the sagittal images, we can see the superior labrum nicely. Uh, one thing to, to remember is that you can have a normal variant, which is a little defect in the central articular cartilage here and the glenoid. If it's just like this, nice and smooth, and right in the center of the glenoid, uh, then this can be just a congenital variant, which is called a central defect. Uh, 
All right, so we have a 55-year-old rollout cuff tear. We have four axial images. So the question is, what is this structure here? So the photograph comes across there, there, and comes across over here. And if we go to the sagittal images, this thing here. It's a coracal humeral ligament? Oh, why? I'm going to go anterior. So this is kind of rare, but it can be confusing uh, if you're not aware of it. This is an anomalous insertion of the pectoralis minor tendon, which can come up and go over the joint space. Uh, it goes over the coracoid through the rotator cuff interval, uh, and it starts into the supraspinatus tendon in the joint capsule. Uh, when you have this, you don't have a corcohumeral ligament. So just be aware that you can have some congenital variants in this area uh, that can occasionally be confusing. And here it just shows the anatomy of the pectoralis minor, as you know it. The major inserts over here on the humerus. The minor inserts here on, up here on the core cord process uh, medially. And then here we can see there's a little bit of signal intensity up in this area. Uh, now here there's a structure coming across the superior part of the joint space. Here if we follow it, it comes over here. Like in the previous case, we have a little bit of fluid going along with it. Uh, here it, we can follow it all the way down. And here we can follow down into the pectoralis minor muscle here. So this is another example of an anomalous insertion of the pectoralis minor tendon. And there you can see coming across the top. These don't, <coughs> these don't produce symptoms, though, do they, John? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. With a lot of fluid around them like this, that they might... But uh, I mean, if, if there is pathology of some kind, but yeah. uh, these are they're from birth, and so yeah. But when uh, you see a lot of fluid around it like this, then it's maybe that's an injury, right? I think that's an injury. And in fact, it's often they uh, if without an injury and without fluid around it, I think most of the time radiologists just uh, uh, ignore it and we don't recognize it. And there are some different types. And here's a paper that talks about various uh, uh, variations of uh, anatomy in the pectoral in the rotator cuff interval. Okay. And the, the first replacement of the shoulder was about that. Uh, at the time, 1890s, it was a rubber uh, versus uh, platinum. I can't remember the fellow's name that uh, came up with the idea, but I, I, I don't think it worked out too good. Okay. It's a 41-year-old male with shoulder pain, so we have multiple slices here um looks like there's quite a bit of fluid surrounding the is it the biceps yeah quite a bit of fluid surrounding it um fibers look intact um but where is it so it's coming over Yes. That? This looks a lot like the other two cases, right? Oh, yeah. So it's an anomalous insertion of the pec. Okay. And again, there are three tabs, so uh, I'm not going to go into it. I just want you guys to. When you see it, and you, if you get confused about it, and hopefully you'll occasionally see it, you'll uh, remember it. 
And here they say it's in about 1.5% of shoulders, which probably means it's seen us already this year and we haven't seen it. And, and they say it can be associated with slap tears, but slap tears are so common. I'm not sure whether there's good evidence to show that it's they're more common in this anomaly versus normal anatomy or not. Okay. Age dependent. Okay. All right. Listen. So I think there's infraspinatus tendinosis. Um, Let me go through some more images. Okay. Um, is that a... I'm not sure if anything else can... Uh, it's, it's hard to see what's not there. <laughs> Um, let's see. Where, where do you see the biceps? I'm supposed to see it. Okay. I do not see you, it. You don't see the bicep, yeah. and there's not really a well developed intertuberous groove in this patient. And here, we really don't see a biceps there. It's a relatively young patient. Here are just some vessels here and the fat there, but no real biceps tendon. And if we go to the sagittal images, that's where the biceps should insert. When we come out here, we're not really seeing anything there. Don't really see any the biceps coming down over here. And this is congenital absence of the biceps. And it's congenital if you you need a biceps in order to develop the intertuberous groove. So if you see someone and you don't see it but biceps, then, and but then you see an intertuberous groove, it means it's torn. Okay. If you don't see biceps and you don't see an intertuberous groove, then you're dealing with a relatively uncommon congenital variation of a congenital absence of the biceps. Yes. And we, you know, we've, we've seen a few over the years. Okay. Okay, let's see, pain after injury. Looking at the biceps here, I think I think I do see the long head of the biceps. It might be medially subluxed, or maybe not. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, another one. All right. I don't see it anywhere here, okay. and uh, I don't see a well-developed intertuberous groove either. So this is another congenital. Absence of the biceps. Nice paper about it. Okay, now uh, we'll spend some time talking about the biceps, and we'll come back over this again later. Uh, the biceps anatomy is a little bit complicated, and biceps pathology is a pretty common cause of symptoms within the shoulder. Now, the, the biceps attaches superiorly here, uh, uh, above, the, above the labrum, and it may have a pretty firm mechanical attachment to the superior labrum, or it may be relatively separated and insert separately on the superior glenoid uh, in this location. Uh, then it comes down over the anterior superior part of the humeral head, down into the intertuberous groove, <laughs> and there it... It mechanically, it would be easy to sublux over the groove because the groove is often uh, not <coughs> terribly deep. What helps keep it from doing that is, is the superior glenohumeral ligament, which attaches to the anterior superior glenoid anterior to the biceps anchor, and it actually comes under the biceps, uh, where it then goes out and attaches to the humerus, the superior glenohumeral ligament. Uh, and this acts as a sling to help support the biceps to keep it from subluxing anteriorly. And if you look at this, it kind of comes under the biceps. They're kind of together 
uh, up superiorly here, and then the biceps will then go down into the arm, and the superior glenohumeral ligament will go over and attach to, to the humerus. But up here at this critical point near the biceps anchor, the superior glenohumeral ligament comes under the biceps and helps support it in its superior position. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the importance of this anatomy and what to look for uh, when we get to the lecture on biceps pathology. So this comes from an article by Richard Hawkins, who was a well-known shoulder surgeon uh, back around the turn of the century. And uh, uh, this was a lecture from a lecture that he gave uh, at one of uh, David Stoller's courses up in San Francisco in 2003. And uh, he said, these are the seven things that an orthopedic surgeon wants to see in an MR report in a patient who has possible rotator cuff pathology. If it's a tear, he wants to know the size of the tear. So usually to give it in two dimensions. I usually give an AP dimension and a retraction dimension. The quality of the surrounding tissues. So we'll talk about how to evaluate quality of the tissues. The location of the tear. In spite of what's in a lot of articles and so forth, I think by far the most common location is the ant starts at the anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon on the uh, 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 at its insertion. And then there's uh, he wants to know the amount of fatty infiltration within muscles, uh, whether or not you have elevation of the humeral head or superior migration which is actually an, an indication of the chronicity of the tear and the size of the tear, and then a chromial morphology and the status of the biceps. And uh, I'm going to come back to the status of the biceps because I think the status of the biceps and the status of the superior insertion of the subscapularis tendons are really very important because, uh, at least in my own experience, as you'll see with my shoulder, uh, I think these tend to be very important uh, pain generators, more so than a supraspinatus tendon tear itself. So, that, so they need to be addressed, and they're and it's important that it's addressed in the MR report uh, for it not to be, uh, so that the orthopedic surgeon knows to carefully evaluate it at the time of surgery. So let's first talk about the size and location of rotator cuff tears. Now, we kind of evaluate the uh, rotator cuff in the past with a number of sequences. We use T1-weighted sequences, proton density with fat suppression, and T2-weighting without fat suppression. Uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of places now that just use T1 and PD fat sat, which uh, I really don't recommend. As you can see here, it's very common for the best contrast for the edges of the tear to be on the non-fat suppressed images. Because once you fat suppress it, you bring out a lot of increased signal intensity due to tendinosis within the tendon, and it makes the actual edges of the tear a lot more difficult to, to determine. T1-weighted images, we really don't do T1-weighted coronal images anymore because we found them not to be uh, add, add a lot of additional information that's not obtained by the T2 non-fat suppressed and the PD fat suppressed. So here you could measure the lateral dimension of the tear, which would be the amount of proximal retraction. And there, I think you need to look at two things. One is you need to actually look at the size of the defect within the tendon itself. The other thing you need to look for is where the muscular tendinous junction is located. That should be around the 12 o'clock position of the humeral head and see how far that's retracted as well. Now, if you have... Uh, if you if you see that the, the size of the tear is not very large, but you have a lot of proximal retraction of the muscular tendinous junction, what well let me ask you, what could do that? Oh. Elior, I think you're next. What could do that? Could it be a tear of the muscle itself? Well if it's if the, we're saying the tendon is if it, it, yeah. It's what I'm saying. Uh, it's what I'm saying is the muscular tendinous junction is retracted, mm -hmm. which means the tendon is elongated, oh. but you don't have a very big tear in the tendon. What that what that indicates, and we'll talk about it in much more detail, is you can get chronic tears 
that then heal in by granulation tissue and scar tissue. We call it scar in situ. So that you can have a situation where you have a lot of proximal retraction of the muscular tendonous junction, but you'll still see not a normal, but an intact tendon. We'll show examples of this. That, that really is the same thing as a full thickness tear, but you have a scar there, which is not very useful. But it can, uh, a lot of radiologists will see this as no focal defect, and therefore we'll call it a normal tendon. But, but we'll talk about this further. So you need to look at both the location of the muscular tendonous junction as well as the size of the tear and the, the lateral diameter of the tear and the distance between the uh, head, top of the head of the humeral head and the retraction of the muscular tendonous junction should be roughly the same size. And then you're just dealing with the tear and, and the tendon. So this just shows well, one of the reasons why we like to use non-fat suppressed T2 weighted images in the coronal plane. And here we can see a T1, this patient with an arthrogram. We can see a T1 fat sat post. And then here's a T2. Uh, what this shows is, in this case, we have a full thickness tear with contrast going through it. Uh, on the T2 weighted image, we see signal going all the way through. Uh, but if you don't have a large enough defect for fluid to actually uh, fill a void there, it's not going to be fluid sensitive on the T2 weighted images. So T2 is somewhat insensitive for detecting a full thickness tear. Okay, here's a T1. Let me see. Uh, who's, who's next? All right. So we have three coronal images, uh, T1, B, fat set, and T2, and it looks like there is a tear of the distal supraspinatus. Yeah, so how would you measure the size? Uh, so I want to do the AC. Speak up, please. Sorry. So I'd want to measure it in the AP diameter and then the amount of retraction. So, so how would you measure the amount of retraction? Uh, so I'd go from the footprint to the normal tendon. So here to where normal tendon is, mm -hmm. here to where would you have normal tendon in I mean, on the T2, it looks like it's right. Right. So, so I like to use the T2s to generally measure the size of the tear on the T2 non-fat suppressed because the edges of the tear usually have best contrast then on that sequence, not always, but usually. And then these areas where you have increased signal intensity within the tendon on the T1 and PD fat set, but it's dark on the T2, are images of severe tendinosis. So this would be the size of the tear, but this patient would have very poor residual tissue, which means that this is going to be hard to sew to because it's going to fall apart. And so that's why Dr. Hawkins wanted to know about the quality of the surrounding tissues. So here you, we do not have good quality surrounding tissues adjacent to the tear. John, uh, you, you cannot really uh, tell uh, on one image uh, as to how long the tear is. Um, you have to have the other sequences. Don't yeah. You? Well, we typically, I typically will measure the tear uh, where it's the longest on the sagittal images, which is the AP diameter, and the longest defect on the coronal images, which would be the amount of retraction. So that's how I usually measure the size of the of the tear. And then I then comment about the quality of the adjacent tissues. And in this particular case, I would say there's severe tendinosis in the remainder of the supraspinatus tendon. Not very good tissues to sew to. Right, right. And so that's how. So here again, quality of tissues. Here's a case where we see a large tear on an arthrogram. And we can see that there's a lot of increased signal intensity within the tendon on the T1 fat suppressed and PD fat suppressed. Uh, even though it's uh, mostly dark on the T2 weighted image. So this is the actual tear size. And this would all be tendonotic tissue here. So 
so that way you can reproducibly measure the size of the defect and then also give the surgeon a sense of uh, the poor quality of the adjacent tissues. Okay. Another thing that you can see uh, on the T1 weighted images and the short TE images uh, is increased signal intensity uh, in the, the central portion of the supraspinatus tendon uh, due to magic angle artifact. And the T2 weighted images help us here also because magic angle artifact is not something you see commonly on the T2 long TE images. It's something only seen on the short TE images. So if you're concerned about whether this is tendinosis or tendinopathy within the tendon, it's also good to look at the T2 non-fat suppressed images. Uh, uh, and we can see that the, there is still nice, good integrity of the muscle. And this is an indication that we're dealing with either very mild tendinosis, or in this case, in this location, this is consistent with magic angle artifact. And if you guys want to do the physics section later, which a lot of the fellows don't want to do, we can talk about what magic angle artifact is later in the year. Okay, Greg? So left shoulder pain, we have an arthrogram, T1 fat set, and PD fat set images. Uh, it looks like there's it looks like there's discontinuity of the supraspinatus. Did you and, see discontinuity? Yeah, discontinuity. It looks okay. like there's a right in there. You see increased signal, but it's okay. So this is an arthrogram. Right, this is an arthrogram. T1 fat set, PD fat set, and we're concerned about this area right in through here. And this is what the T2 looks like, Greg. So T2 looks like there's maybe maybe some increased signal kind of intersubstance, but it looks like it's intact. So this, the area we're concerned about is really out here at the insertion, uh, but on the T2, it really looks like that insertion is intact there, right there. Uh, this patient went to surgery. The patient had some degenerative change of the acromion here, and they thought they had impingement, but the rotator cuff was completely intact. So again, the reason why I like to have the T2 non-fat suppressed images is because it really helps with determining the margins and the integrity of the tendon when you have tendinotic tendons. So this is severe tendinosis, uh, but the, the tendon was intact. The musculotendinous junction is near the 12 o'clock position, so there's no proximal retraction of the musculotendinous junction, which if this were a tear, you would expect some proximal retraction there. And uh, here again, the T2-weighted image is helpful. And uh, the really major complaint that we had for a while among sports medicine surgeons was that a uh, claim that, that MR had a high uh, false positive rate and that people were going in and doing surgery and, and not finding a tear. And uh, I think there are two causes of that. One is this one, because people did not have T2-weighted images and they misinterpreted severe tendinosis as a complete tear. Uh, the other thing that you can have is a very high-grade partial tear uh, where just the capsule on the joint side is maintained but the rest of the tendon is not. And I'll show some examples of those also. When I see that, I, I always uh, uh, comment that it's a high-grade near full thickness tear, but the joint side surface may still be intact. We, I got one complaint a number of years ago from one of our other radiologists who called a tear. The surgeon was all upset because they went in and couldn't find a tear. And in retrospect, just the surface of the just the joint side surface of the tendon was probably intact. But the patient's symptoms and functionality in that situation is uh, pretty, much pretty much a full thickness tear, and they'll pretty much rapidly convert into full thickness tears. So if they know about that, if they decide that they're symptomatic enough, uh, they should repair those if it's that high grade of a tear and they're symptomatic. And therefore, it's good to describe it properly so that they they understand when they get in there that they're dealing with a very high-grade tear, but it may not go all the way to the surface. 
Okay, who's next? Thanks, Mike. All right, so looking at the T1 and PD fats, I would see what would I would think was uh, some moderate to high grade bursal surface defect uh, near the junctional zone, but looks like that's resolved on the uh, T2 and um, yeah, it just looks like tendinosis. So, so this is another arthrogram. In this particular case, what this is is a moderate grade joint side surface partial tear with contrast extending into the partial tear. We don't see a complete surface here. Inferiorly, you have to change the window and levels to look for that. But what happens again, if you have uh, not highly diluted contrast, you'll get a gray signal on the T2 weighted images. And so the T2 can be a little bit uh, uh, difficult to interpret in this setting. Uh, but but this was a moderate grade partial tear uh, in, the, in this patient. They went in there and saw that, but they they elected not to not to actually repair it. Okay, so here PD fat set pre. Just some increased signal in the supraspinatus. In the okay, so now an arthrogram. Um, it's it looks like a pretty smooth undersurface. I'm not. Could that okay? Could that be some retraction of fibers? That kind of dark. Yeah. Okay. So, in in the early days, we would do a, a sequence without contrast, then inject the con, and then inject the contrast, and then and do it. Uh, uh, you know, that ends up being very expensive to do it that way, so nobody does that that way anymore, except for r rare exceptions where you want to exercise the patient in between. Uh, but but this is a, a low-grade partial tear uh, of the joint side surface, inferior surface. It, it's just a portion of the inferior um, supraspinatus that's... that's torn and, and retracted just a few fibers maybe but uh, it's not a complete uh, yeah. uh, tear by any means but well, but this is one of the reasons why a lot of radiologists like to give uh, do arthrograms is because you can actually see the uh, defects sometimes uh, much better with arthrography contrast in than you can without it uh, I personally think that it's very rare that this actually changes the treatment. This would be a situation where you'd have tendinopathy of the supraspinatus tendon, but not a significant tear, which is basically what we see with the arthrogram as well. We just see the anatomy better. And that, that doesn't look to me like it was a, an operative case. Right. Uh, the patient didn't go to surgery. All right, so we have an MR arthrogram, T2, and FATSAT T1. Uh, looks like there's some increased signal kind of at the insertion of the supraspinatus. Uh, so be concerned for our intrasubstance tear. Okay. And then what's this? Uh, looks like some fluid. It's not, it doesn't have the same signal as uh, the contrast. So. Right. And then, uh, looks like there may be a slap tear there. Yeah, but it, it's pretty subtle in the T2. On the T1 FASAT uh, study with contrast, we can we can see that contrast freely goes through the the base here all the way. So uh, the slap tear is much better seen on the arthrogram, and uh, in general, uh, labral tears I think are somewhat better seen. Uh, but I think that that generally only makes a huge difference in the in the young athletes. So again, in older individuals, I don't recommend it. Slap tears, as you know, or degenerative changes of the superior labrum, are very very common in, in older individuals, but they're not uh, treatable lesions in general. And here we can see that there is contrast is not going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So instead of this being a a full thickness tear here, this is a 
interstitial partial tear going to the bursal side, producing some bursitis. Okay. Greg? So, so we have a T1 fat sat arthrogram. Um, it looks like there's contrast uh, within the joint space. Um, and then on the T2, looks like there's increased signal at the insertion of the supraspinatus. So what is it? The foot plate. So it looks like there's a tear at the insertion. Um, so, so one thing to remember is, if you do the T, when you look at the T1 fat suppressed images, uh, if you give contrast like this, you'll see the area of the contrast, but you're not very good at evaluating the integrity of the soft tissues, a bit like a CT scan. And there are people still, I'll occasionally see MR arthrograms where the only images that you see after putting in contrast are T1 weighted images, T1 and T1 fat set. If you get a PD fat set, you're going to see this, obviously. But if, and that's why it's very important, and I think you'll hear it over again from me and others, that uh, uh, after you give contrast, you can't just do T1 fat suppressed images, or you're going to miss pathology. And this was a very high grade bursal side partial tear that actually ended up going into repair because of the patient's symptoms, which you couldn't see on the T1 fat suppressed image because the T1 fat suppressed doesn't have good soft tissue contrast and the contrast wasn't getting into the area of the tear. So beware of if you see any arthrogram images where the post images are only T1 fat suppressed. All right, so we have PD fat sat, T1 fat sat post arthrogram i mean there looks like there's a near full thickness uh bursal surface footprint tear that is completely hidden on the yeah t1 so, so again this is a pd fat set so we're going to be sensitive to fluid uh without that you could easily have missed this very high grade partial tear right there and then we can see uh a little bit of uh this is Probably not contrast. Maybe there's a tiny bit of contrast there, but it's we see fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid verse on the PD fat set image, which we can't really see uh, on the uh, T1 fat suppressed image. And there's the tear. And that's what the T2 non fat suppressed looked like, similar to that last case we had. And this is what the tear looks like on the sagittal images, that characteristic location where the vast majority of tears start at that anterior insertion of the supraspinatus tendon. Okay, and here's, just, here's a case where the patient, there's no contrast in the joint space. This patient had a subacromial contrast injection, uh, so a bursogram rather than an arthrogram uh, in this particular patient. And again, you can see the contrast all in the wrong location. So we see this not well, a lot more frequently than we would like. Now, uh, one thing, uh, a view that, that a lot of people like, and one of the first people to comment on this and actually publish about this is actually Philip Tierman. So you can ask him about the Abra view when you see him. And this is basically, you put the arm... Uh, above the, the head, uh, an extended externally rotated view. Uh, the original thought was that that would put traction on the uh, capsule attaching to the anterior labrum and pull the labrum off so you could see the anterior labral tear better, uh, which is the case here. We don't really see a labral tear in the regular position views. We go into the Abra view and you can see the tear in this location. And this was confirmed at, at surgery. Uh, so that's the Abra view. Uh, we did a 200 cases uh, uh, looking at the regular position and the Abra view. 
we, we actually found that the Aver view obscured anterior labial tears about twice as frequently as it made them more visible. So you can't just use Aver views because often the, what the Aver view will do is you'll put tension on the anterior capsular insertion and that will pull the actual labial tear back into position and squish out any of the contrast there. So uh, uh, this, uh, the labor view, you, you basically put the patient in the scanner, you have to do the regular views, then you have to take them out of the scanner, put them back in with a different coil, or reposition them so it takes more than twice as long to do the study. So I, I find that it's uh, something that's great to do if you're in an academic center where you uh, where you're working directly with the text, you're kind of in a hospital setting, uh, uh, but in a setting like RedNet, where uh, the, the, you're in outpatient centers, uh, musculoskeletal radiologist typically isn't there uh, to review things, uh, it, it uh, can be very difficult logistically to, to, to perform. And uh, I, I find that I, I only recommend it in the known overhead athlete uh, where you have an MR scan that's that's kind of non-diagnostic and you have concerns about it. And as we'll, I think, look at later on, one of the areas where I find it is a little bit helpful is looking at patient, patients, overhead throwing athletes who have internal impingement that we'll talk about, which is the posterior superior part of the joint space. But we'll talk about that later. So this is the ABRA view. Yeah. I've always said uh, that uh, anybody that can tolerate this procedure in, in a scanner with the arm abducted uh, doesn't need any kind of surgical procedure. Yeah, it is, it is a stress. Because it's a pa painful thing to do to somebody who is, who really has pathology of any significance. Yeah, and let me say one thing as someone who's had pathology and uh, has been in the scanner many times for it, uh, for some reason, if you've got pathology in the shoulder, one of the most painful things you can do is lie in an MR scanner. Something about the position of the shoulder and the coil where it can become very painful. That's why you'll often see motion artifacts, especially in the later sequences, because lying in that position is just very painful, much more so than upright. And the other thing that you'll talk about, and uh, it's really real, is patients who have rotator cuff surgery, one of the biggest problems is sleeping because it is very painful to lie down at night and try to sleep after you've had surgery. It's just, it's just a painful position for the surgery. So a lot of people will have to sit upright at night after the surgery, and a lot of people have difficulty sleeping in an upright position. But we'll talk more about that when we go to pathology. Okay, who's next? Okay, so is this an orthogram? Um, I mean, there's a lot of dark signal in the so joint space. What's going on here? Uh, what could that be? Could that be air? Could that be... Okay, could be air. Uh, uh, usually with air, you'll get susceptibility artifact on the edges, but mm -hmm. the air is a good one. What else could it be? Uh, could it be an issue with the contrast itself yeah. that was injected? If the contrast is too concentrated, mm. you'll lose all your signal before you can acquire it, and it'll be black. The other thing is if you put in hyaluronic acid, and it's also very dark like this, so people who have injections into the joint. And this is a case where the concent where it was too concentrated, mm. and here we can see this uh, concentrated fluid, and we actually see uh, some contrast probably diffusing into the bone here with it being this concentrated. So if you're in a center and you see this, which most of us aren't anymore, what you would do is uh, ask the patient to hang around for, or come back in a couple of hours and rescan them, and then it would dilute enough where you can see the contrast, and I've, I've done that before. Uh, or you can just bring them back a day or two if it's like where we are, where we don't see the scan for another day or two. You can bring them back and do non-contrast non studies, and there's almost always then going to be 
fluid in the joint space and you'll get the contrast from native fluid. Okay, next. So what, what's happening here? Well, so we have indirect arthrography. We have a T1 pre and a T1 fat sap post. Uh, let's see. So first, what is indirect arthrography? It's a good question. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so this was popular a decade ago. I haven't seen very much of it in the literature since, but here's a, this is a situation where you'll inject the patient with IV contrast, you'll exercise the shoulder for 20 or 30 minutes, then you'll bring them into the scanner, and what happens, the IV contrast will diffuse into the joint space, uh, give added contrast. Now, the, the issue here is it diffuses into the subacromial cell do, subdeltoid bursa uh, as it does into the joint space, where, therefore, if you see contrast in the sub, subacromial subdeltoid bursa, that's normal in this procedure and doesn't necessarily indicate that you have a tear. In this particular case, we can see the severe tendinopathy here, high-grade near-complete tear with a little bit of intact uh, bursal side surface. Uh, <clears throat> but this is, this is just a contrast enhancement uh, in, into, into that area. <clears throat> uh, the The... Downside is that the signal to noise isn't isn't great. <clears throat> you don't get as good a contrast as you do with a direct arthrogram. You also get fluid and uh, you get contrast in a lot of other joints. Uh, I mean, in a lot of other bursal sides surfaces, which we see here. Uh, and uh, uh, I've I've really done only one or two of these, just uh, tried out and didn't like it. Uh, but this was popular among uh, a number of people, especially people who were doing uh, these studies outside the hospital and without necessarily having a radiologist around where they could just have a nurse do the injection rather than a radiologist do a joint injection. And then, But I think most people now believe that uh, this is, the, our current quality of imaging is much better without doing indirect arthrography and if you really need to do arthrography, you, you might as well do it properly and do a direct arthrogram. But you still may see, if you may go some places where they still may be doing this procedure. Okay. And here's another area where you have severe tendinopathy. And when you do an indirect arthrogram, you get enhancement in the area of the tendinopathy and then contrast extruding into the bursal surfaces in the joint, the joint surface. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, another thing that that you can do. Well, let's see. Okay. So uh, if patients can't have MR, then the other thing that you can do is a CT arthrogram. Uh, it used to be with patients who had pacemakers, we would recommend the CT arthrogram. Now, most of the pacemakers are fine in an MR scanner, uh, so we'd prefer to do MR arthrography. But here, you bring the patient in, you do the injection, and you do the CT scan, and you can see fluid extending into the, so across the defect into the supra, uh, into the junction. Now, the, the other thing that you can do in people who have, uh, where, you, where you can't do an MR scan, and you have people who are have an allergy to iodinated contrast, is uh, the other thing is that MR contrast, which is actually what this is, is uh, if you put it in full strength, is CT dense. So you can do a CT arthrogram using MR contrast. Uh, for those rare patients, and this happened to be one of those patients. And here you can see this is MR contrast, uh, that's CT contrast on a CT scanner, and the MR uh, contrast can, in extreme situations, be used as a contrast agent. Oh, I'm sorry, this this patient was, I've, this was iodinated contrast, but you can use uh, gadolinium, and this is a case of a patient like that. This was a patient who had a uh, as you can see, a prosthesis in place here, and uh, could not have MR, 
and this is, and it was supposedly allergic to iodinated contrast, and this was a direct MR uh, CT arthrogram using MR contrast. Uh, that's not diluted, is it? That's not diluted, right. All right, well, that's kind of an introduction to the shoulder, and we'll move on and uh, talk about, uh, I think, impingement in the next talk. Okay. See you guys mañana. All right, later. Let's see. Have a yeah. good evening. Thanks, John. Thank you.